Sunday. Uh, good morning. Um, and I have to get used to saying good morning because now we're at 11 o'clock uh, a.m. We're starting a greenhouse at 11 a.m. In case you're not watching this at 11 a.m. We're now going to be starting uh, in the morning. We're excited about that. Um, a couple of announcements before we get into the text today. Uh, we have a lot of uh, events planned from right about now to the end of the summer, going all the way up to September. Uh, if you want to check out our events page and what's going on here at Greenhouse and some of the outreach um, things we're going to be doing, uh, I encourage you to go to ghproject.org. You can go look under events. And we got a lot of events planned out there. We need volunteers for these events. So if you want to sign up to be a volunteer, please also do that on the website. You can go and find uh, volunteer signups for every one of those events we're having. I think the next thing on the calendar for us is Saturate. Uh, it's going to be an outdoor uh, tent revival. We're, uh, we're coming from Salt Churches out in California. And they're coming across here to us on the East Coast. And uh, they have a passion for just genera generating um, passion and fervor for discipleship and for evangelism and just revival in the church. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, it's going to be located at uh, Calvary Chapel, Delaware County, outside. Uh, so come out to that. You can find that on our website, too. Uh, if you want to give, um, everything we do is made possible by your generous giving, uh, your, your uh, giving to the Lord. Um, so if you want to give, you can go onto our website at ghproject.org and go to our Tithely, and that's the, that's the best way to do it. So just look it up on there. Um, aside from that, uh, we're just excited you're here. We're excited that you're joining us this, this morning. Uh, and our desire is to partner with you uh, wherever you are in your walk with the Lord and just walk alongside you. And uh, we, we value discipleship here. Uh, so everything we do is, is uh, geared towards discipleship. Uh, we value that so much. So we're just glad you're here. Uh, and I'm going to pray for us. And we're going to get back into our text, back into Matthew chapter 18. So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you uh, for this opportunity to, to share your love, Lord, to share the truth of your word, um, to preach it, um, to believe it, Lord, uh, to, to speak it in authority, Lord. Not my words, Lord. Uh, let uh, diminish anything that's my opinion, Lord, or my, my feelings about anything. And Lord, elevate, we want to elevate your word and your truth, Lord, above all things in our lives. Um, so help me, guide me this morning at, as, I, as we just deal with your word uh, and deal with what you taught us, Lord. This is everything to us. Uh, and soften our hearts, Lord. Help us to be conformed to it, Lord. We just ask this, uh, and we just join together, Lord, in agreement with your word. In your name, Lord. Amen. All right, guys, uh, we are back in Matthew chapter 18. We're going to be uh, finishing up here. Uh, we're picking up in verse 15. So if you open up, you have your Bible with you, open it up to Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. And we're going to get down to verse 35. So it picks up and says, Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three, wit of two or three witnesses. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses even to, to the church, uh, let him be to you as a Gentile and as a tax collector. And truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two, or two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am amongst them. So, we pick up in the beginning of this, this, uh, this passage here, and we know that we remember last week we were talking about these little ones coming into Christ as a child. That's how Jesus desires for
for us to come to him. That's the only people that will enter the kingdom of heaven, one, ones that come as a child. And so he refers to these, these little ones, that we should not despise one of these little ones, that we shouldn't stumble them, we shouldn't cause them to sin by, by looking down on them, by, by sending them away because of our own ambition. But these little ones here have now become uh, the brothers that Jesus talks about here. If your brother sins against you, so the little ones have become the brother in Christ. So we are brothers in Christ. These little ones that come humbly, they come as children seeking to do the will of Jesus, seeking just simply to follow him, are your brothers in Christ. Uh, and now these brothers are brothers that just happen to have committed some kind of sin, maybe against you. But this brother, this, this word brother of Jesus calling, it, uh, calling us brothers in Christ harks back to the scene where Jesus emphasized to his disciples uh, that whoever follows him, that ever, whoever seeks to do the will of his father, that's who he calls uh, mother, brothers, and sisters. You know, he says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? But whoever does the will of the father is my bro mother, brother, and sisters. So Jesus, his plead with his disciples, what he's telling them and emphasizing them so much is that we should not disrupt that relationship that has been established by him. The ones that come as little ones are our brothers. They're our sisters in Christ. And Jesus is saying, do not disrupt that relationship that you have, that brother relationship you have with them by looking down on people, but by uh, not forgiving them in your heart, by holding things against them, by, by being uh, satisfied with division. Um, you can't come to Jesus with any sense uh, of your own right to be there. You can't come to Jesus uh, believing he's accepted you because you've done something right, that in your own right you have some kind of right to be here with Jesus. It's all because of what he's done. You can't come to him with any kind of ambition to be the best disciple, to be the greatest among disciples, um, as the disciples were arguing about and we looked at last week. You can't come with pride or selfish, selfish uh, motives. We talked last week about despising the little ones, looking down on them, looking down on people that humbly want to come. They make themselves as children. They want to follow Jesus. They maybe maybe don't know anything really at all. They're not they're not uh, they're not uh, articulate in theological matters, but they want to come follow Jesus. When we look down on people, when we look down on our, our those little ones that come. We, we despise one another. One of the major ways we despise one another, the way Jesus talks about despising each other. One of the major ways we do this in the church is by not forgiving our brothers and sisters in Christ of the things that Jesus has forgiven them of. We can't not forgive people of things that God has forgiven them of. We have, we have no right to do that. We can't hold against our fellow believers things that Jesus, by his own blood, paid for on the cross of Calvary. He went to the cross to forgive them. If you have not done that, you know, you have no right not to forgive them. And all sins are ultimately sins against who? They're against God. They're against Jesus. They're against his holiness. Jesus has the right to forgive. And he has. And he, he's done it through his own sacrifice. So you don't have a right to not forgive other people. If we're submitted to Christ... We're concerned what his desire for, is for us. And we imitate what he came, he did. You're really, you're really out of your lane, really, <laughs> when, you, when you don't forgive people. It's not your job to not forgive people. It's your job to tell people the good news of the gospel, that Christ came to forgive the world of its sins, that he came and died for them, that they've been forgiven should they accept what Jesus did for them on that cross. That's your job. And you're not behaving as a disciple. You're not behaving as one enlisted by Christ, but of your own accord, of your own ego, when you don't do this. I know I'm coming in a little hot today. I'm coming right in. 
uh, rebuking, but consider this, and I, I think this happens for a lot of us. When, we, when we've been walking with Christ for a long time, or for some time, you know, we stop struggling with some of the sins maybe we used to when we, when we first met him. Maybe you come out of a life of drinking, partying, maybe, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's sexual sin. And as you've been walking with Christ for some time, those things stop being such a pervasive issue in your life. They, they stop becoming the big issue. Christ releases you from the, you know, those really just super destructive sins. Um, the things that are really uh, weighing on you when you come to him. But Satan, um, he's still going to try to use sin in your life. And maybe you don't have, maybe it's not the partying, the drinking, it's not drugs. Maybe it's not any of that stuff anymore for you. But Satan is going to, will try to use things on a seasoned believer that are just as evil and just as destructive. Satan is going to use slander. He's going to use gossip. He's going to use evil suspicion. He's going to use all these things to destroy the unity in the church, to try to curtail the effectiveness of the church. Uh, and to try to divide and break up the unity that Christ, he, he went and prayed for, for to the Father in, in uh, the Gospel of John. He prays to the Father that we would be one, that the church would be one the same way that Christ and the Father are one. And Satan wants to, de to destroy that any way he can. But he's going to use things that are just as evil and just as destructive, like slander and gossip. And don't think for one minute that those things are are like a different tier of sin that aren't as bad as those, uh, those other sins. Pride is the sin that, that God hates the most. Pride is what God resists. And Satan will try to seed pride in your life. And don't think for a second that it's not as destructive because it absolutely is. And it absolutely will divide the body of Christ. And Satan will use you like a tool. You don't want to be a tool of Satan. You know, don't be a tool. Uh... <laughs> Jesus lays out how we should deal with a brother who sins against us here in this passage. Um, so as, we, uh, as Paul says in Galatians 1, uh, 6, verse 1, uh, that if any of us are caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him uh, with a spirit of gentleness and keep watch on yourself lest you be tempted. So, so Paul's plead with the church and the, the church in Galatia is that you should restore your brother who has transgressed. Um, and Jesus is showing, giving us, laying out a model for restoring people. And it's so important that we restore people that are in sin, that transgress even against us in a spirit of gentleness. Because it all comes down to this. This is what it comes down to. When somebody sins against you, your response is either motiv motivated by one of two things. Your response is either motivated by vindication or it's motivated by restoration. It's either, it's either motivated by the personal vindication. If you're sinned against, you want, you want to make it known that you're right <laughs> to, the, to the public and to that person. You want to feel personally vindicated uh, because you feel that like you're wrong. And personal vindication is a response that comes from the flesh. Uh, it comes from the self-seeking part of us that wants our own our own image restored and we don't we don't allow ourselves to be absolved into the kingdom of God to the work of the building the kingdom of God so restoration is motivated by the truth of the gospel by the same heart that Jesus had and Paul says there in, in Galatians the verse I mentioned that he says you who are spiritual right he says you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness so when you you seek to restore rather than to condemn so that you might be vindicated you are you are spiritual you're operating in the spirit it's the spirit that causes us to restore rather than than to to vindicate ourselves and he does he says that and i like the way that new king james says it keeping watch it's a continuing thing <laughs> if so if you don't restore in a in a spirit of gentleness you you will fall into sin yourself. It says, be careful that you do not fall into sin yourself, um, lest you too be tempted. Uh, it's so easy <laughs> to, to 
to respond in sin, to respond with gossip and slander and all, all these things that divide the church when we've been sinned against. But it's the spirit that motivates us to go and restore a brother. So how do you do this? And Jesus lays it out for us. How should you do it? And you always have the option of just being long-suffering, you know, just letting things go, especially if they're little things. But sometimes you have to confront somebody. If something is really big. It's something that's really getting in between you and your brother in Christ. Uh, and if it's a serious sin, that might destroy another person's life. But Jesus says, go and show him his fault. And if he listens to you, you have won your brother over. So go directly to the person, okay? Not somebody else, you know, not 10 of your closest friends or 10 of your acquaintances or post it on the church bulletin or whatever you want, you know, get in the group me. Don't do that, okay? And also don't pull one of these, right? Oh, just coming to like one of your, you, somebody you trust, you know, and, and saying, oh, I need prayer for this situation, you know, because, uh, you know, Tommy, he did this and, you know, X, Y, Z, and he's a big jerk. Yeah, like don't, don't, uh, you know, kind of put it in the box of, of prayer and present it that way or needing prayer for a situation um, just so you can talk about people. And, I, yeah, I'll be the first to admit I've done this, okay? I've done this. Uh, I've, I've needed forgiveness for this. But don't, don't disguise it as needing prayer for a situation or, or uh, just needing to, to vent. We'll always talk about venting. That's a big thing. But you got to go straight to the person. And he says, if he listens to you, when you go to the person, you give them the respect of going to them privately. If, if he listens to you, you've won your brother over. So this word, one, in the Greek is uh, kurdineo. And it, mean, it carries the connotation of gaining back something of value that was lost. Um, and that kind of harkens back to the previous passage that we went over last week where Jesus leaves the 99 to go after the one. Uh, and the reason why he goes after the one because is because the one is valuable and you're winning it back. Something that's lost. The 99 are not, uh, not in danger. They're living in the grace, living in the safety of being in Christ. But if you go after the one, you gain back something of value that is lost. And we have to have the same heart as Jesus. We have to be ones that go after the one. And we have to see people as val valuable enough to go and try to restore, not just to use them as a, as a punching bag for our, our own ego. You know, that has to be our attitude or else we're hypocrites if we claim to follow Jesus and we don't do this. I want to say this. Winning a brother is much sweeter than winning the battle in the public arena. Winning a brother is much more valuable than being vindicated. It's better than your personal vindication. That restoration is so much sweeter. And when if you ever have been in that situation and you're able to restore a relationship with your brother, you, you know how sweet it is. You know how, how uh, powerful of a moment it is. And you get to experience, you don't just win back the relationship, but you get to experience some of the love of Christ in that moment. Proverbs 18.24 says this, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And the writer of this proverb is telling us that a man that's concerned with his reputation and kind of the wideness of his relationships rather than the depth is going to bring himself to ruin. If you care more about how, how you appear in the public sector and, and in uh, society, then that can bring you to ruin. It allows pride to well up in you, pride to take root in your life. When you're more concerned with the wideness of your relationships than the depth, and the depth is discipleship. Um, caring for that deep disciple, discipleship relationship is so much more fruitful than the abundance of those acquaintances or people you might call friends, um, but it's really your own reputation, your own image. And we have to be so careful about, about this in our personal lives and careful about this in the church as a whole, in the, in the uh, more wider sense of the, the contemporary church culture. We see this so much, uh, always wanting you know, a bigger church, more, more people, more hype, 
uh, but maybe lacking in that deep, uh, those deep friends that are closer to them than a brother, lacking in that deep discipleship relationship. Um, it's a big problem when we can't go and confront sin in the church for the lack of, for the sake of losing people, and losing people in those seats. We have to ask ourselves what, what motivates us when it comes to what we do is, is in the church. When it, when it comes to people, are we do we need people for the sake of, you know, consensus? For, you know, do we see people, a lot of people being in our church or around us as uh, confirmation or affirmation that we are right about everything for that moment, momentum and the, the hype that they kind of bring? Or is it the affirmation of your ministry? Or is it genuine discipleship and spiritual growth? You know, truth is not based on consensus. Truth isn't based on how many people like you and how many people say you're right. Uh, it's about obeying Christ. It's about the word of God. We have to be careful of this wide mindset. So we have to care about someone deeply enough to actually confront them. And two, we have to do it with gentleness and a genuine desire that they be restored. A genuine care for the person. Not for ourselves, not for how we look, not what other people will think, but a genuine care for the person. And I'm going to say this. If you get excited about correcting somebody's sin, you should not do it. You should not, you should just leave it to somebody else, okay? So if you get excited, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you want to come in with like the biblical smackdown. You know, we've seen the memes. Like, you know, the glasses spin, you know, reform thug life, you know, the, whatever the rap song plays, you know, I just, you know, I just took you down with the word, you know, that if you're feeling like that, if you get a little too excited, then you shouldn't do it. You should leave it to somebody else. Uh, you know, you hear it, you know, oh, well, I have a discernment ministry, you know, I, I got, you know, I have the gift of discernment. It's like, okay, the gift of discernment is a real thing. But we all have, you know, the gift of discernment. It's called pride. It's called thinking that you're better than other people, <laughs> you know? Uh, and that, that's, not, that's not what that is. If you're not genuinely grieved, this is what I'll say. If you're not genuinely grieved over somebody's sin, if it's not difficult to, for you, and it's not something that you have to pray about and ask for the strength to go and do it, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. You probably like it a little bit too much. You have to be, if you're not genuinely grieved by the sin and genuinely desiring that that person be restored, then you're wrongly motivated. You're motivated, you're motivated by that vindication and not the restoration that we're talking about. So Jesus says, if that doesn't work, going to the person directly refuses you, then go and get two or three witnesses. At the end of that passage, at the end of the passage, he says, when two or more are gathered in my name, I am, in, I am there with them. I'm in their midst. And this doesn't mean, that's what this, this means. This doesn't mean that if there's more than one person, we can go, you know, destroy somebody for whatever we want. You know, this is, doesn't mean like as long as we got like the consensus, then we can go, you know, have that, you know, biblical smackdown of this person. It means if you do it in his name. In his name is key you know this isn't this doesn't mean you know if you elicit the name of Jesus you know this isn't like oh yeah give Lord give me a million dollars in your name you know amen you know that's not a it's not a enchant you know some kind of enchantment that you, or a incantation that you say at the end of whatever it is that you want but it's doing the will of Jesus uh, in Jewish law for, for cases that came up in the local community, um, there would be there would be judges that over oversaw these cases, and they would need there would need to be three judges coming together in agreement. So long, and the stipulation was so long as the Shekinah, which is the glory of God, was in the midst of them. And Jesus here is is uh, kind of giving an illustration here kind of hearkening to that to that Jewish law. But what Jesus is really saying here is that he is the glory of God 
that rests among believers when they come together in agreement about anything. He is the glory of God that rests in them when they come in agreement in his name, doing his will, seeking him. His glory is there amongst them. And when, so when you come together in agreement and you seek the Lord, you know, we have, when we come together with two or three witnesses to go confront somebody, it has to be seeking the Lord, seeking the glory of Christ himself. And you, when you seek the glory of Christ himself, you're going to go in that spirit of restoration. You're not going there to hurt this person, to go, you know, beat them up spiritually. You're not gathering, you're not gathering a mob, you know, to go spiritually, like, mug this, this person, whoever it is. You know, it's not that getting more than one person justifies whatever you decided to do, but it's if you go in the name of Jesus, going and seeking his will, it's contingent upon whether it is in his name. So, if that doesn't work, Jesus says, bring it before the church. And, it, you know, the verse here doesn't really specify whether that's pastors, leadership, or people in the church. Now, I would, I think it's preferable that you go to a pastor and bring it up to him and say, you've gone through all these processes, you know, before it becomes a public issue. But the thing about this is going before the church is the moment where it goes from being a private issue to a public issue. So before it goes to a public issue, you need to make sure you've done those things. It's not any of the moments before that becomes public. It's a private issue before, before this happens. Only now does it become a public issue once you've, you've, you've uh, gone to the person and you've brought, you prayed about it, gone with, you know, with two or three more witnesses. Um, then it becomes a public issue. And then finally... It says, treat them, if they won't listen to any of this, treat them as a Gentile or a tax collector. Put them out, away from you. Now, I want to say something here. Very, it's going to be the very, very few times, very much the minority of situations where number four is necessary, where that last step is necessary. If you've done one, two, or three correctly, you know, correctly applied them, this usually doesn't have to happen. But there are times where this does have to happen. And I'll say it's more rare. But however, there comes a time when a person that's persistent in unrepentant, sinful behavior, and not just this, un that has, it has a sinful influence on the church body. That has to be dealt with. Paul wrote in the church, into the church of Corinth, who were dealing with a man that was having these sexual relations with his mother-in-law. Really gross stuff. Really deep sin. He said, you were to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. He says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, as you, are readily, as you really are unleavened. Uh, and this idea of leavening, leaven leavening the whole lump is, you know, it's, it's Jesus telling us about the nature of sin. Paul is talking about the nature of sin, that it will spread. It's, it's similar to cancer, that leaven is similar to the concept of cancer in this way, that cancer in the hand will, will be cancer in the arm, and in the body, in the head, it will spread everywhere. The sin is not isolated. When you have such a sinful influence in, in the church that won't, that won't be repented of, that it's persistent, it's not a thing where they're stumbling over a sin and they and they have a heart that's repentant, but it's this persistent behavior that is not repentant, uh, and it's having an influence on the church body. You have to put it away. That first, by not treating them as treating them as a gentile or tax collector, putting them out of the church, might restore them to their senses, but also re restores the church and the division that has happened in the midst of them and keeps that sin from spreading throughout the whole church body. But this is a very rare thing. Uh, you have to come into this very prayerfully. So the verse, uh, the passage picks up and says that Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often will you, will my, will my brother sin against me that I must forgive them? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. And this passage, you know, Peter asks, how far can, should you go to forgive? And the thing that Peter is doing here 
And is he still thinking in the terms of the law? It's hard for him to get out of, out of the concept of the law and the limitations of the law. He's still thinking about how he could quantify things and measure them. And Peter, he, he's looking for this material answer. And in Jesus' in his response, is telling him that, oh, it's 77 times, Lord Peter. It's not seven times. Well, he's saying it's an unlimited amount of times. That's what he's saying. He's saying it's not a matter of how many times can you do this and then go for the, you know, the takedown. He's saying your heart must change. Peter's still looking for that moment where he can go, you know, okay, I did it seven times. Now I can go condemn a brother who sins. But that's not our job, what Jesus is saying, here on planet Earth. <laughs> here in this world, you know, God is the one who justifies or condemns. But our job is to tell them the good news of the gospel. Our job is to restore the one who sins. It's that restoration that God has sent his son into the world to die, to restore us to a relationship with him. That's the good news. That's our job. We don't need to take it in our own hands. We can trust God to judge rightly. He is going to judge rightly over the whole earth. And I think if we were more concerned, if we thought more about that day where God does judge, it judges every man according to their deeds, we thought about what that day will entail, we would be less concerned about uh, being vindicated in this, this life and more concerned about genuinely restoring those people and sparing people from that judgment, bringing them into the fold. In Amos 5, verse 18, he says, Woe to the one who desires the day of the Lord. Why would you have, the day, why would you have that day of the Lord? And hasten it. It, it is darkness and not light. We thought about how, uh, how terrible that day will be for those who are not in Christ, that are not submitted to him, that haven't been restored. Uh, if we think more about that, we'll be more concerned with restoring our brothers and telling people the good news of the gospel than we are about vindicating ourselves. And forgiveness is the defining feature, it's the defining characteristic for us as Christians. It's what defines us. It's what makes us different than the world. It's the key factor in the economy of Jesus, that up, upside-down kingdom uh, that makes us different than the world, that makes Jesus' message so unique and so powerful. So we have to be defined by forgiveness. We have to be defined by restoration. In verse 23, it says, Jesus continues with this parable to illustrate this. And he says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle a accounts with his servants when he began to settle one brought to him who owed, one was brought to him who owned who owed him 10,000 talents and since he could not pay his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and the payment and the payment to be made and so the servant fell on his knees imploring him saying have patience with me and I will pay you everything and out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So this fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him and said, have patience with me. I will, I will pay you. And he refused. Uh, and then he went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. And when the master summoned him, he said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave all that the debt, all that debt because you pleaded with me. And and should not you have had the mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in the anger in his anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you who do not forgive your brother in your heart, your brother from your heart. So the one thing I'd like to point out first here uh, in this parable is what 10,000 talents is. 10,000 talents is an extraordinary amount of debt. This guy, I don't know how he racked up 10,000 talents, but I don't know, he, maybe he, he's got too many cheap tickets to Vegas. I, he clearly had a, some kind of gambling problem. But 
this is not a normal death uh, that a servant might have. Uh, we remember in the parable of the talents that Jesus uh, tells us, you know, he, he deals with a man, somebody who gives one, two, and five talents. And that's a normal sum of, normal sum of money to kind of loan. Uh, MacArthur, in his commentary, he points out that uh, in, in this, the same gospel, uh, we're pointed out that all the annual taxes that came from Idumea, the regions of Idumea, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, um, were about 900 talents altogether in one year. So, so this is about 11 years worth of taxes from all those regions combined. That's how much this, this debt is that this servant owes. And, and aside from that, uh, 10,000, the, the word 10,000 here uh, is the Greek murias. And this could be translated literally as 10,000, or it could be an expression of an innumerable amount of money. Just a, a way of, it's the largest, uh, it's the largest number, you know, in, in the Greek. Uh, so it could just be an innumerable amount of money, saying this innumerable, unpayable debt that the servant owes. Either, you know, either way, the this, this slave, the this servant owes something that's completely impossible for him to pay. But he says, oh, I'll pay it all. He makes this, this claim that he can't really do. And all he wants is patience. The next thing here uh, that I would point out is that the master and the servant in their two uh, dealings with people that owe them money, the master has the right to condemn or to forgive, and the slave does not. The master carries with him more authority. And of course, the master here represents God. If God has the authority, and we do not. And if the one with authority chooses to forgive, then we can only tell the world about the good news that the, the one who is, who is above all things, who is the master of everything, has chosen to forgive us should we believe in his son. And the servant pleaded with the master, have patience with me, and I will repay you. And that servant makes this promise that he can't keep. And the, the difference between the servant, the servant's debt to the master and the servant's, uh, the other fellow servant's debt to this servant is the ability to be paid back. This servant owed 100 denarii. That's, you know, that's a, a good amount. It's 100 days wages, um, but it's payable. It's doable. And they both, both the servant to the master and the servant to this other servant ask for patience. But the master gives to the servant not just pay, patience, what he asks for, but he gives him forgiveness. He absolves his debt. He says, you don't have to pay it back. But all the, the servant, like, like this servant, his fellow servant asks for what? He asks for patience. And he doesn't even give him that. You know, not how often do we pray those prayers? You know, Lord, just be patient with me. I'm in this sin again. I'm, I'm, I did this again, but Lord, be patient with me. I'll get it right. We, we pray those things rather than, Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinner. <laughs> forgive me. I don't know how to stop doing this, Lord, uh, but I need your strength. I want to be submitted to you. Yet at the same time, how, how often we're unable to forgive our brothers in Christ the one who goes astray, the one who sins against us. We're unable to have something so, so simple as patience with them, that they might get it right, that they might not do this. You know, we have, we have to be, we have to give people at least the patience. We have to be long suffering um, with people, with the body of Christ. Um, because God has done so much more than that for us. He's, he's forgiven our debt. Um, you know, in closing, uh, there was a, there's a pastor or a writer back, back in the 1600s, I can't remember his name, but he said, he that cannot forgive others breaks the bridge over which he too must pass himself. For every man needs forgiveness. You can't forgive your brother. You're smashing the bridge. You're taking a sledgehammer to the bridge that you're going to need to cross over. 
to get into the kingdom of heaven, to get into the kingdom of God. All of us have passed over the forgiveness that Christ has given us. And when you can't give that to your brother, you destroy the thing itself. You destroy the way we enter the kingdom. You, you destroy the means of salvation itself. When we refuse to, and, and the last thing really I want to say is when we refuse to get forgive others, we do it at the expense of our own discipleship. We, we do it at the expense, the expense of being able to truly follow Christ and all that he, he asks of us. We, we do it at the expense of the harmony of the, our inner spiritual lives, the personal walk we have with the Lord. And I'll say this. The extent which you're able to forgive others is the extent which you will be used by God. The extent you're able to for, the extent to which you're able to forgive others is the extent to which God will use you. Consider real quick the the story of uh, Jim and Elizabeth Elliot, these missionaries in Ecuador to this this certain small uh, people group in Ecuador. Uh, they went there, and maybe I don't know if you've seen the movie End of the Spear. I would recommend watching it. It's uh, it's a really moving s story. But the story, and what I wanted to focus on is is Elizabeth, his wife. Jim Elliot was was killed uh, by a violent group, group people group, um, when he came onto the to the into the area in Ecuador. Uh, preaching the gospel to them, being missionaries in that area, um, he was he was killed in the line of the, the mission. And the amazing thing is the story of forgiveness and his wife, uh, Elizabeth Elliot. She comes back to Ecuador, and she goes and stays with those people, living day in and day out with the people, uh, the same people that that killed her husband. And through those years of sitting with them, and it wasn't even an immediate thing, but through those years of sitting with them, that whole people group, the majority of all those people, came to Christ. Christ. They professed Jesus. And that's the amazing story of forgiveness there. And you might think, look at that and say, I can never do that. And you, it's true in your flesh, you couldn't ever do that, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, by submitting yourself to Christ and being made more like Him, you can do the, that. Um, that Whatever the extent to which you are able to forgive others is the extent to which God will use you. And to do that, you have to be submitted to the Holy Spirit. And when we, when we exercise the, those, what the Holy Spirit gives us, when we, when, we, when we get those gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us, and we operate in the fruits of the Holy Spirit, they won't fail to produce fruit for the kingdom of God. You know, Corey Ten Boom said, "Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can can function regardless of the temperature of the heart." So what she's saying is that forgiving somebody is an act of the will. It doesn't matter how you're feeling. It doesn't matter how you feel about somebody, uh, and how 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 much uh, emotions that it that it comes with, and and how uh, how heated that you get about it. It doesn't matter how you feel. You can exercise your will to forgive because it's obedience to what God has asked you to do, to, to what Christ asks of us. If we have any success in our lives as Christians and as disciples, we have to exercise the will uh, over, over the emotions, over how we feel. So if there's anybody in your life uh, right now that you just need to forgive, that you need to go to and make things right, my, my prayer, my call for you today is to go make that right with that person, to bring the unity in the church that Christ desires for us, that he prays to the Father that we would have with one another the same way he has with the Father. So let's pray. Dear Lord, um, we just thank you for your, the ways you've forgiven us, Lord, the great mercy, Lord, the, the grace that you lavish upon us, Lord. Lord, I just pray that um, in response to this, Lord, that we would be filled up with your spirit, Lord, we would be filled up um, by seeing who you are, Lord, and the ways that you love us and the ways you give us grace and mercy, Lord, more than we could ever pay. We owed an immeasurable, innumerable debt, Lord, and you paid it all, Lord. Um, 
help us to con- that to compel us, Lord, to restore our brothers uh, that have gone astray, to restore our brothers that sin against us. Um, to not make ourselves right, Lord, but to make the body whole, Lord. So we just pray for this, Lord. We pray for the same spirit that you operated in. Lord, no matter how, how much we feel, help, help us to simply obey you and what you, you called us to. So we just ask this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, and we'll see you next week.